Welcome to Osseo Boston, and I want to welcome everybody if you're here live. I want to thank you for your participation in tonight's program. And if you're one of our YouTube audience members, I want to thank you for getting on. And if you like what you see, um, give us a thumbs up so that we know you like the content. It helps us to develop future programs. And if you really like it, why not subscribe? Anyway, tonight I have the privilege and honor of uh, introducing Dr. Howard Sesso. And Dr. Howard Sesso is an associate epidemiologist at the Division of Preventive Medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital, um, associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, associate professor of epidemiology at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Um, he is also the Associate Director of the Division of Preventative Medicine and Director of Nutrition and Supplement Research at the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine right in at, the, at Mass General. Uh, he's published more than 350 papers, teaches courses on clinical trials and epidemiology, and he also mentors students and faculty. And so with that said, we are really excited to welcome um, Dr. Sasso. So let me go ahead and... So first and foremost, Shelly, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I think, uh, you know, research um, is um, it's always an interesting place to be at because you're at the intersection of, of kind of the clinical piece of it the patient side, the participant side for research and everything too. And for today, um, what I'd like to discuss, um, at least from my perspective, is where we are with nutrition and dietary supplements for bone health. Um, my perspective is, um, it's interesting. I think I, I was kind of raised in the research world as what we call an epidemiologist, and that has had a different connotation for all, the last few years in particular with the pandemic. But but typically we really focus on doing these larger studies in the population to look at patterns and trying to predict who or what types of nutritional factors might be more or less relevant for bone health. Um, but in fact, um, since over the last two decades of work that I've been involved in, I've grown to appreciate the value particularly of randomized clinical trials and how they can provide much more specific answers to questions. Maybe not all the questions that we might have with regard to nutrition and dietary supplements, but it does help to shape the way that we look at them in the context of bone health in particular. Um, and before I start to jump into things, I think um, one thing that happens a lot in the media, and I think a lot of times when you're trying to read up on this topic in particular is what I call dietary reductionism. And you know, we do a good job to identify the foods and the dietary patterns that might reduce major morbidity or mortality or um, improve um, bone health in different ways, but we don't really know which vitamins or minerals or nutrients or bioactives are necessarily responsible for it. And where I've been particularly interested is obviously I'm interested in nutrition and food, food matters, of course, but, but dietary supplement use has become, has remained incredibly persistent in the United States in particular. And it makes it difficult for us with all the supplements that are out there to understand what might work, what doesn't work or what does work or what recommendations should be made. And so it really puts the consumer in, in particular in a very difficult position. And what further complicates it is that the, the rules and regulations of our government for dietary supplements is, um, I wouldn't say ambiguous, but it's, it's deliberately loose. Um, and back in 1994, there was um, um, a, a law passed called the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act and it basically says that, um, you know, from the FDA standpoint, you know, supplements are essentially foods, not drugs. So if you take a blood pressure medication, that has to go through a particularly rigorous process to get approved. But for supplements, dietary supplements that you see in the market, they don't have to necessarily go through that. And that leaves it a little, um, that, that, that middle ground is, is difficult to discern whether something has been tested. What's the evidence? Is it something we should or shouldn't take? And, and this is all in the background of the fact that dietary supplement use in the United States remains in persistently high. Um, and you know, overall among US adults, about, about 
um, a third to a half of US adults take at least one dietary supplement, but more notably, it's related to age. So older individuals are more likely to be taking supplements and then women are more likely to be taking supplements than men. So you put those together. And if you look, for example, in some of the work that I've been involved, some of the trials I've been involved in, it's very e easily um, half to two, like half to three quarters of our participants before they even enter our clinical trials, we're already taking at least one dietary supplement in the first place. But what does that mean? Does it, do they work? Do they not work? And why are they taking them in the first place? What complicates it, and this is true for bone health as well as other areas, um, you know, you go to any CDS or Walgreens or any other place where you might purchase dietary supplements. And I know for me, it's actually overwhelming. You walk into the store and you go, and there's usually an entire aisle devoted to it. And it's very difficult to figure out, you know, if you're interested in purchasing something, first of all, what do you get? And further complicating it is that virtually all these um, supplements will have these different types of claims about maybe it's nutrient content or structure function abilities or perhaps a qualified health claim. But there's always that small print that says something to the, I forget the exact language, but something to the effect of, you know, the statement has not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. And this isn't really meant to essentially treat or cure a disease or prevent a disease. So there's always that um, kind of caveat language built into it. So what I'd like to do is just, um, in the context of bone health, it's actually been a very interesting story. I, I wanna highlight just a few of the large scale clinical trials that have been done in particular that have been incredibly instructive for helping us understand what the role of particular supplements might be on um, bone health or bone mineral density, for example. Um, one of those studies is the Women's Health Initiative. Um, this was the, um, it's probably most well known for the fact that it was a hormone therapy trial um, that was begun in the, in the late 1980s and finished up um, 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 around the late 1990s, early 2000s. But there was also a vitamin D and calcium component to the trial that was tested, looking at its impact of calcium and vitamin D supplementation on fractures and some other um, site-specific cancers like colorectal cancer. Um, and then there was also a dietary modification trial. Now, WHI tested what was once believed to be the right idea, which was the low-fat diet. Low-fat's not quite the right diet that we want to do. We want to be focusing on um, specific things, not just low-fat, but the types of fats, of course. But what was interesting about the Women's Health Initiative is that um, um, that dietary modification trial did look at um, whether if you have women essentially um, adhere to a, a special diet that's going to be low in total fat and saturated fat. Um, what they found after several years of follow-up in, in um, nearly um, 50,000 women, that there was really no overall effect of a low-fat diet on, um, on um, hip fracture or, 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 um, or at least falls. Now, the only thing that it did seem to be potentially linked with was perhaps a slightly lower risk of falls. And we don't know whether that's because of bone health or because of just improvements in dietary status in some way. But the other part of the Women's Health Initiative that was interesting is they also looked, again, at this, they had a separate trial that was looking at the, the um, combined calcium and vitamin D supplementation. Now, one thing that's interesting is that the amount of calcium and vitamin D that they tested was actually quite modest. Um, the amount of calcium was, um, I think, 400 milligrams per day, and the amount of, um, of um, vitamin D, I think, was also 400 IUs per day. So that's much lower than what we see now in the more recent trial that I'll, I'll mention briefly. But in the Women's Health Initiative, um, again, these were middle-aged and older women. What they found was that um, the rates of fracture were a little bit less, but not significantly less for those that were taking calcium and vitamin D supplements versus placebo. So, um, you know, so from the Women's Health Initiative, at least there was not a lot of strong evidence at least, to suggest that, um, that there was any benefits to taking calcium and vitamin D in combination to reduce the risk of fracture. Now, the, what the Women's Health Initiative is not the only trial that's been done testing vitamin supplements. Um, our, our own research group here at the Division of Preventive Medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital, um, at which, um, which I'm a part of, um, also conducted um, what we um, uh, was mentioned before called the Vitamin D and Omega-3 trial or VITAL trial. 
Now in this trial, we tested a higher amount of vitamin D. So this was 2000 IUs um, per day of vitamin D. And, it, um, and what was interesting about this, this was about a five year trial and it included almost 26,000 initially healthy men and women. And what was unique about this trial was that um, it was also able to measure baseline levels of, for example, 25 hydroxy D, which is the biomarker that a lot of people are getting to measure vitamin D status without really knowing whether it really, you know, again, how predictive is it actually? People get it measured, um, but don't really know how that translates to actual long-term health outcomes in a, in a trial setting. But what was interesting is that um, a colleague of mine who's here at the Brigham, um, Dr. Merrill LaBeouf, um, led some, um, some interesting analyses and has published a few findings on um, the effect of vitamin D on bone health. And in particular, um, when they were looking at, um, um, for example, um, bone mineral density. So um, if you look um, either at the spine or the neck or the hip or whole body um, that can measure through something called DEXA, um, what they found was that there were really no significant effects of 2000 IUs of vitamin D supplementation on um, bone mineral density over a two year period of time. This was in a smaller subset of um, about 775 or so um, men and women who were analyzed. So they looked at both men and women. And when you look separately at men, separately at women, there were also still no significant differences there either. So it did even call into question at least the role specifically of vitamin D for bone health here, um, or at least it's a lack of effect. It's not a risk, but it's a lack of effect. And that still has a lot of important clinical in, um, meaning as well. Um, Dr. LaBeouf also looked at fracture in the vital trial. So this was with about uh, five years of, of total follow-up um, in um, nearly all of the, um, virtually all of the vital population of about 26,000 men and women. And even for this, they also found that taking 2,000 um, international units of vitamin D supplements daily versus placebo also resulted in no effect on confirmed incident fractures, whether you looked at total fracture, or if you looked at, um, at hip fracture in particular. Um, they did look at a few other secondary endpoints um, that were um, excluding kind of the fingers and the toes, just um, trying to reflect not just a simple fall, but, but things that might be related to bone mineral density, and there was still a lack of effect there also. So um, again, even in the vital trial, we had seen very little evidence for vitamin D supplementation specifically on fracture. Now, the, the other um, trial that I've been involved in, um, which was alluded to, was the COCO Supplement and Multivitamin Outcome Study. Um, we, all the studies we do always have these kind of goofy acronyms. In this case, it's called COSMOS. Uh, we like to have acronyms to simplify it instead of saying the name every single time. But nevertheless, um, this COSMOS trial that we had done was in about 21 and a half thousand older um, women and men. Mean age was about 71 years at the start of the study. These were participants who were from around the United States. Um, our study was based in Boston, but um, we send calendar packs out to the participants who enroll in and are randomized. And they were taking either um, a cocoa flavin or a cocoa extract supplement, and then also a multivitamin supplement. The multivitamin in particular is of interest given the fact that most of the um, common, the, the major multivitamin supplements that are on the market, those that have like 20 or more of the essential vitamins and minerals, not the selected ones, um, do now have, um, you know, usually sufficient calcium of at least 200 milligrams, and they'll have at least a, um, a thousand IUs of vitamin D. So even a multivitamin could, could represent an alternative option for um, older men and women um, to take in the context of bone health. Now, unfortunately, we don't have the results yet. Um, Dr. LaBeouf, who I mentioned before, um, has gotten funding for an NIH um, grant um, that we're um, actively analyzing right now to look at the effect of the multivitamin on both um, falls that happen in this population as well as fracture. And also we'll be looking at um, uh, bone mineral density as well. So these results are still forthcoming. We, we don't have them yet, but certainly something to stay tuned for. Hopefully within the next year or so, we'll have those results ready. Now, you know, the one thing that I always um, get asked about is, you know, should I take a dietary supplement, whether for bone health or for other aging related health outcomes? And my answer is always the same. Um, it's complicated. Um, and for many reasons, um, 
the idea that a, a single supplement, whether it's vitamin D or calcium or something else, is going to work in everybody is probably a misgiving. Um, but in reality, we want to still identify those individuals who might be more apt to benefit. And one such way to characterize that is thinking about the role of baseline nutritional status. And that's where if you can meet with a dietitian or just talk with your primary care provider, it really becomes a nice way, a, a sounding board, if you will, to see, you know, how's your diet now? What types of nutrients are you getting? Um, how can you improve your diet as a first line defense before you start considering some of the supplements that you might turn to? The supplements should not serve as a crutch, but rather a way to enhance your diet and nutritional status. And, um, you know, depending on the types of supplements that we take, you know, it still is critically important for us to understand what the mechanisms of effect are. You know, the trials that I've been involved in over the years are typically very large scale long term trials, but um, just because we see an effect, we still need to understand or explain it. And we still are very unclear exactly how, if, for example, calcium and vitamin D do or don't have a role with falls in bone health, bone mineral density, osteoporosis, et cetera, um, we're still not exactly sure how the mechanism is working. And so it's very difficult to make global recommendations in this regard. The one other thing I just wanted to um, mention briefly is that um, there are also many herbal supplements out in the market that are often turned to um, for um, osteoporosis and bone health as well. And I think this is actually a very under-researched area as far as I'm concerned. We do lots of work in the essential vitamins and minerals and, and supplements, but not necessarily the herbal remedies that are out there. And some of the examples, um, in particular, um, curcumin, and ginger are two supplements that have been looked at often with regard to either bone mineral density or um, fracture or other um, indices of bone health. And in fact, if you look at this, there's really been very limited and smaller studies in this regard. It doesn't stop the supplement makers from putting um, um, potential you know, statements on their products saying that, you know, this has not been endorsed or reevaluated by the FDA. So you always have to take what you see on the labels with a certain grain of salt because the clinical trial evidence, particularly for herbal remedies, is just not nearly as strong as what we think we know with regard to the vitamins and minerals. And in fact, um, this always comes back to the question of, you know, we need to, we need to make more of a focus in the research world to really conduct more clinical trials of not just the herbal supplements, but some of the other commonly taken supplements um, by US adults and, and including older adults. Because a lot of people take these supplements or even adhere to certain aspects of their diet thinking that it's gonna be beneficial for bone health without really having enough evidence to back that claim. And we wanna make sure that we're making um, recommendations that are not just practical, but also achievable, and also have what we call efficacy, that they that it will actually result in improvements in health that are meaningful and measurable. And that still is um, a, a big debate, certainly in the nutrition space, and also in the, um, in the research space. Um, one final point I wanted to make, and then I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to take some questions from, from the group, is that um, there is a group called the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. Um, this is a group that, that convenes, uh, there's really no scheduling to it, but roughly every kind of eight to 10 years and looks at the, the, the current um, research, if you will, for dietary supplements and health outcomes. Traditionally, they focused not as much on bone health, but rather on cardiovascular disease, cancer, and other major morbidity. Um, and, but, but of note, they did have um, a series of new recommendations that came out just last year um, and in that, um, uh, in that task force, this U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, um, they basically pretty much repeatedly said that the evidence is insufficient for most of the key, commonly used dietary supplements for, at least for cardiovascular disease and cancer, but this also extends to bone health. I had alluded to the Women's Health Initiative, the, the VITAL trial, um, and the COSMOS trial, and there are a few other trials um, that have looked at some of these dietary supplements and, um, and bone health. But in fact, we really do need a lot more research in this area so that we can make more definitive recommendations. Whether it's, it's supportive or not is of less concern to me. It would be nice, even if we find that something doesn't work, that actually has just as much public health relevance 
to me as something that shows that something might be beneficial or even if certainly is, if something is harmful. So any outcome from these clinical trials carries a lot of public health relevance. Um, of course, the media and other entities will spin it their own way. We can't always control that, but it, it just emphasizes the need for us to continue to do research in this area and understand exactly what the role of nutrition um, is in the context of bone health in particular. So um, with that, um, you know, thanks for your attention. And um, I'd love to take any questions that you might have about um, this whole topic um, um, from the broader scope. That's awesome. Wow. Thank you so much. This is filled with uh, lots of information. I, I just wanted to ask you per, um, one question before I turn it over to uh, the uh, chat. And I'll just read you some of those questions that come in. But um, in that vital trial, Dr. Sesso, uh, were the people that were studied, were those people that had osteoporosis? Or was that a, a segment on what age group were they? You said, I'm not sure I wrote that down, but. Uh, yeah, so yeah, that's a good question. In, in the vital trial, their mean age at the start were in their um, mid to upper um, and, and younger 60s, so basically late 50s, early 60s. And um, just by virtue of the eligibility criteria, the women were a little bit older than the men at the start. We did not specifically um, exclude any individuals who had any history of osteoporosis in the vital trial. And when we analyzed the data with regard to falls, um, we first looked at it overall, regardless of whether you had any history, and we didn't see an effect. And in fact, if you tried to either exclude those that had a history of osteoporosis or looked to see if the effects were different among those who did or didn't have a history at the start, um, we didn't see any strong evidence for the effect being any different. Now, that being said, um, the one part, the one um, aspect of the study that was interesting was that um, you know, if you were to actually measure 25 hydroxy D levels and assess vitamin D status, there was at least some suggestions that maybe if we learn more about nutritional status, not just vitamin D status, but nutritional status, that that might help us understand um, which groups or which subgroups of women and or men might benefit more. But even in a large trial like VITAL, which was nearly 26,000 um, men and women, um, even that's not quite a big enough study by the time you start cutting everyone up into smaller groups to really look at those answers as definitively as we'd like to. And then um, if that's the case and that, um, I mean, weren't there other studies that showed that vitamin D and calcium historically, like the work with Dr. Haney and uh, all the trials they did at uh, Creighton University and all of that and, and originally, mm -hmm. weren't those uh, add some validity to that argument? And uh, when that study, was that the study that just came out? I mean, I don't mean to give you a double question, but something came out a year ago. Was that the same result that we heard that it doesn't matter to take vitamin D? Is that the vitamin D study or was that another one? That was the vitamin D study that you're alluding to. Okay. And, you know, the one of the challenges that we have as researchers is that there's lots of, I mean, there are lots of good research being done in lots of places, needless to say. But what's always difficult is how do we connect the study, the different studies that come out together? Every study is always a little bit different from the other one, whether it's the patient population. So maybe they're coming in with a history of osteoporosis, maybe they aren't, mm -hmm. um, or maybe they're high risk. Um, or um, other subtle but important differences, such as what is actually being tested. You know, what's the amount of, say, vitamin D or calcium? or anything else, um, or what's the source of it? You know, Even the source of particular vitamins and minerals could make a difference in terms of absorption and things like that. And, and then that's even before thinking about the role of something like um, nutritional status and how that factors into it. So it becomes very difficult when you have, even if you have say six or seven very good studies that were done separately and independently, then the challenge is, um, and this is where you know the different um, um, uh, medical groups and other associations try to put the pieces together and make sense of it. But a lot of times it's almost like a Jackson Pollock painting where you have these blotches of color in different directions and you're trying to make sense of it. And you put a hundred um, clinicians and or epidemiologists or researchers in the room and they're all gonna have a slightly different interpretation of what those results mean together. So that's where 
know, the recommendation process can be quite challenging, but it's an important process that's undertaken. Sure. And, you know, and I guess I'd love your take on that then, just to finish off that question. Uh, if the doctor, if your endocrinologist, um, you know, countrywide is, or most of them are telling us to go ahead and, and take vitamin D and calcium as our only supplements, um, how do we weigh that with what, what you've just said? So the good news by and large is that of the trials that have been done, particularly with regard to vitamin D and calcium, none of the trials have shown any excess risk. So now that's not to say that everyone should feel comfortable taking vitamin D and or calcium supplements because there's no risk. Of course, we, what we really wanna know is, does it actually help in some measurable way, whether it's you know going in for multiple bone scans or whether it's, am I gonna be less likely to fall? Am I gonna be less likely to develop osteoporosis or whatever outcome, it's not just in bone health, it's in other, um, any aging related health outcome. So it's, um, this is the challenge that we face. The perception for many dietary supplements that we take is that um, you start taking a supplement and this is generic, this is a generic comment. You start to take something because either your primary care physician or your endocrinologist or someone has told you to do so or recommended it, you take it. There's no obvious negative side effects from taking that particular supplement. So then the perception is, well, it's not hurting me. I'll continue to take it. Maybe it's helping me. Mm -hmm. But the problem is maybe it's helping me is not necessarily enough from my perspective. We don't want to see consumers necessarily wasting money on supplements that are essentially coming straight to your system and not doing anything. So, so yeah. we really need more studies to, to carefully tease those effects out, what's really happening on the beneficial side or even on the risk side. Absolutely. Oh, I, I, I appreciate that answer. Um, okay. Um, people have uh, asked about other studies. I don't know if you're familiar with any um, of the prune studies, for example, for uh, bone health. Yeah, I'm not as familiar with the prune studies for bone health. I think, though, um, what's interesting is that, um, you know, when you think about um, the prune studies, usually I'm thinking about it in, in, in terms of GI health, of course, but yet at the same time, um, this is the challenge that we face with nutrition. Um, when I think about nutrition and, um, and bone health, in particular osteoporosis, um, I'm always hesitant to isolate effects or benefits to a single food or even a single nutrient for that matter. It's not to say that um, the prune studies might or might not have merit, scientific merit. They certainly might. But you know, to me, the best first line defense, and this kind of relates back to my training and, and my kind of orientation as a researcher and epidemiologist is that when you think about lifestyle, you think about the entire picture of lifestyle, not just diet, but exercise and, and, um, and psychosocial health and all the other things that roll into it. Um, so should we emphasize eating prunes? Sure, couldn't hurt, but certainly in, con in the context of other fruits and vegetables and a healthy diet that are going to be rich sources of all the nutrients that we know matter for bone health and osteoporosis and other aging related outcomes that we're concerned about. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, one thing I think about as I, I was reading up on a lot of your studies and, that, you know, a lot of some of them, like, you know, I guess the last one you did, maybe it was the vital one or, or the cosmos one is you actually took a sample of the gut biome uh, microbiome like and I thought oh that's really good because a lot of times I feel like you know how did how can you even study a vitamin or how can you even because everyone's diet is so different and what are you actually looking at so I was kind of excited to see all the work you've done and how you your thought process in terms of wanting to narrow that field down and I think it's quite a challenge it is, um, you know, diet is incredibly complex. I mean, even if you look at something as simple as we'll, we'll pick on a, a strawberry, just as an example, like literally pick, I guess, but, um, but the idea, even if looking at a strawberry is that, you know, there are strawberries that are grown in California. There are strawberries that are grown in Florida. There are strawberries that are grown in Mexico and South America, and of course, all over the world. The soil conditions, the growing conditions, the climate, pesticides, all these things 
you, know, you look at a strawberry and no two strawberries are the same. And then you magnify that into the completeness of the diet and how that varies, not just, um, not just within a metropolitan area, but even regions of the United States or regions of the world. Um, it's incredibly complex. In our work, we tend to oversimplify it, which is the challenge. We, we isolate, we say, um, strawberries are good, berries are good for health. Well, great, but different people are consuming different berries and have the ability to have economic access to those foods too. So um, for nutrition and, and, and even lifestyle more broadly, when we're trying to look at that in the context of things like osteoporosis and bone health and, and everything that rolls along with it, um, it's incredibly complicated. And, and, and for this reason, this is where randomized clinical trials have strengths and limitations. The strength is that it allows us, whether it's a dietary supplement or a, a particular medication, or if it's um, or, or some other specific exposure, if you will, it gives us specificity. It allows us to test very deeply and comprehensively to test whether a vitamin D supplement in vital at you know, 2000 IUs, does it reduce the risk of fracture? It's a very simple and clean answer to it without the dangers of what we call confounding. Confounding in scientific lingo is the idea that there's some other third effect or other, other factor that could explain an association that you see. If we didn't do a clinical trial and you see that I'm taking a vitamin D supplement and it might be linked with a reduction, say, in fracture risk, is it because of the vitamin D or is it because I'm taking vitamin D and I'm taking other supplements and I have a good diet and I, am, I, have a higher, I have higher income level and that gives me access to better medical care. So these other explanations are eliminated in clinical trials. So that's why I always weigh the clinical trial evidence much greater than the other observational studies that are done. Not that the observational studies don't carry any weight, but you have to listen to, listen to those results or hear about them with a little bit more caution. Yeah, I, I love that, uh, that. And I think that, like, for example, I think you mentioned the physician health study that you're in, quite involved in. And the fact that, is that the one where you send out the vitamins in a packet to people? And um, that seems really good because you can control what's in the vitamin where, you know, my multivitamin is probably very different than whatever I took two years ago or something, you know. Yeah, you know, I think um, the, the count, I, I wish I had some with me, I would have held it up, but I can always send a picture of it to you. Um, the calendar packs are neat. They're good for um, ensuring that the participants don't really know what they're taking, because there's this notion of blinding, um, or double blinding that I as the investigator or any of you as a participant will be taking something without being able to tell what you're taking. So that doesn't impact your behavior in some way. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, with this is one of the challenges and actually dangers with dietary supplement studies and research is that it's much easier to study something that's in a capsule than it is to, under, to study prunes or strawberries or tomatoes or, or other healthy foods or beverages for that matter. Um, it's better scientific control for the question, but then it also oversimplifies it. And so, you know, there's and so for that reason, dietary supplements are more amenable to these types of studies or trials. But um, what I would love to see is kind of looking more at the diet more holistically, looking at particular dietary patterns. There's a lot of talk more recently about um, the impact of, say, salt intake or, or ultra-processed foods. Um, but trying to do a trial where you're limiting or, or altering the diet is much more difficult to do than to be told to take a pill that you get in the calendar pack. So so these types in the nutrition field, it's just incredibly complicated and it's, it's difficult to peel off those layers and understand what's really going on. Yeah, it's great. Um, any, um, I, I wonder if I can ask you about specific vitamins, like vit someone asked about K2, MK4, MK7, strontium. Could you comment on those? Uh, yeah, you know, I think um, for vitamin K2 in particular, there has been some evidence, you know, you think about um, um, bone absorption and everything. You, you start to think about calcium, vitamin K, um, magnesium, and other that some of the other minerals. Um, there, surprisingly, there have not been um, that many, at least randomized clinical trials that have looked at some of the minerals 
and, and as well as vitamin K with regard to some of the um, bone health outcomes such as osteoporosis, fracture, falls, et cetera. Um, and so I would say, the, and, and that extends out to MK4 um, and 7 as well, the, the, and, and strontium for that matter too. Uh, the evidence from the clinical trials is actually, I would say, too scant. Um, and, and one of the challenges that we see, at least I see, I've seen over the years in dietary supplement research is that um, it's hard to, it, it's hard for, it's hard to get funding from the government in general for most of the research we do, but even that research that we do get funded, um, the government typically doesn't expect to pay for the supplements that you're using to test. So a, a, a supplement and a placebo. Um, and so a lot of times, you know, and a lot of the work that I've been involved in for these larger dietary supplement trials, we typically turn to some of the companies that produce them and say, you know, we have an idea for a trial. It's our idea, not theirs. Um, but would you be willing to contribute the pills, um, the matching placebo, the, um, and, and the packaging, whether it's a bottle or a calendar pack to do the trial? Um, and we've been very lucky with the trials that we have done over the years to have um, very um, caring and thoughtful um, partners, um, um, industry partners who have said, we like your hypotheses, we'll let you test it independently of whatever we're involved in, and we'll give you what you need to make it happen. But if you think about it, it comes with a risk. So if I'm a relatively small company that produces um, strontium, just as an example, and I think that there might be some benefits on bone health, I mean, the right thing to do from my perspective would be to do a randomized clinical trial and put it to the test. Let's see if it works. The problem is that you are investing resources in that trial. Maybe you're working with me or some other investigator around the world. You do the trial that takes time and energy and money, but there's a risk. What if you do the trial and you find that strontium has no effect on, let's say, um, a fracture, or there's no effect on, on um, some of the other measures of bone health that we can do? The company has just supported a study that's undermining <laughs> their marketing yeah. group. And so, and, and it's not to say that industry has fault or blame in this. There's, there's almost um, an inherent disinc disincentivization for them to want to invest in these types of studies, even though from the public health standpoint, from the consumer standpoint, it's the right thing to do. So it really puts everyone in an awkward position to make these types of studies happen. So that's a longer answer to your question about yes. K and K4 and 7 and strontium, but we don't have a lot of good clinical trials in particular for these reasons. Oh, that makes it a challenge. It definitely does. Okay, and let's see. I'm going to try to limit the questions to what we've been talking about. Um, oh, someone wants to know how they can participate in some of these clinical studies. <laughs> Is that possible? I'm, I'm, I love it when people ask me those questions. Um, I would be happy to um, share um, my email address with you. You can reach out to me and let you know about some of the studies that we're actively recruiting for. Um, um, the ones that I was highlighting initially, um, the VITAL trial, the um, COSMOS trial, and the Women's Health Initiative trial and study, um, those are no longer recruiting, unfortunately, since those trials are complete. But we are constantly cycling, cycling through new studies. and. Um, and uh, to be perfectly frank, I have the utmost res respect for people who participate in the research studies that I and others in our group have designed. Um, I say that for two reasons. One is that I'm not sure if I would ever be a good participant. <laughs> I'm not sure if I would the patience for it and also the willingness to be randomized, not knowing whether I'm getting a particular intervention or a control or a placebo, but also the time investment. Um, we ask a lot of our participants sometimes to provide blood come in for um, clinical assessments and things like that too. So for those of you that are interested in research, whether for <laughs> this area or other areas, um, I have had more and more respect over the years for the participants, far more than we as scientists. We just play with the data and figure out what's going on. That's, that's great. Okay, so the, um, the COCO study, the COSMO study, someone asked if that had any um, bearing on bone health at all, did it? Yeah, so we're actually, we're actively, in the COSMOS trial, we're looking at both um, a multivitamin intervention versus placebo, as well as a cocoa extract supplement versus placebo. And in fact, we're actually looking at both of those interventions simultaneously to see whether either or both have any effects on, on fracture bone mineral density, 
um, falls and just bone health more broadly. Um, for cocoa in particular, um, there's very little evidence out there about whether there are any potential benefits. The, the mechanisms um, coming into this project were actually stronger for the multivitamin given the amount of evidence that um, has already been built up over the years, particularly with regard to calcium and vitamin D. Um, but given the fact that we've done this trial um, and um, given the fact that, for example, cocoa seems to have some potential vascular effects, it wouldn't be a, a stretch to um, argue that there could be some extension to bone health in some regard or even functional status. So these are studies that we are actively um, analyzing the data for and can never pinpoint exactly when it will be published. But I think sometime between now and hopefully middle of next year, we'll hopefully have that out in the public domain. Well, I certainly hope that there's some connection. <laughs> if it has anything to do with, with, uh, with that factor. Okay. And also, um, let's see. Oh, would you repeat the name of the U.S. Task Force on Supplements again? Yeah. So it's called the U.S. United States Preventive Services Task Force, USPSTF. Um, this is a group of, um, this is um, kind of government sponsored or supported. It's a number of, of um, experts in the field um, that have been identified. They're all um, kind of, and their, their job is to come together and put all the studies together and try to interpret it and try and do it in a very agnostic, neutral manner. Just what does the data show? And from that, try and come forth with recommendations to help people understand what they should or should not consider, at least with regard to dietary supplements and, and health outcomes. Um, but just to reiterate, um, since we're here to focus on osteoporosis and bone health, um, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, despite all the studies that I was alluding to earlier, um, has not included um, any of the bone health outcomes in their recommendations. They've only focused on, on cardiovascular disease, cancer, mortality. Not that those aren't important. Of course they are, but, but it would be nice to see them extend their recommendations to other health outcomes, given the fact that we as a country um, we're, we're an aging company, but a, a country, but we also want to age better. Um, and it's not just um, those harder clinical outcomes, but but um, but obviously osteoporosis and bone health and falls and and cognition are all things that affect the quality of life and the quality of how we age. And this, to me, is just as important, if not perhaps more important, than um, some of these other clinical outcomes as well. Right. I mean. Even I, I think I read when I was looking through your things that the Cosmo study helped the um, cocoa flavanols and the and the multivitamins both helped with cognition and cognitive uh, improvements. Yeah, very briefly, we had two studies that had come out over the last uh, about two two and a half weeks or so that found support um, in a set in a in a small subset of about four thousand participants, we had looked at both the multivitamin intervention in which um, just taking a daily multivitamin seemed to improve um, short-term memory. Um, and um, that was over both a one-year and a three-year period of time. And um, for the cocoa flavanol intervention, the cocoa extract intervention, um, we also saw improvements um, um, in memory, particularly among those who were not consuming high amounts of flavanols. And that's um, not just from cocoa products, but also berries, um, as well as grapes and red wine and tea, um, but it's generally a plant-based diet. And this connects very directly, even though it's, and this is the challenge that we have as researchers is that um, ideally it would be nice to identify dietary patterns and nutrients and dietary supplements that are not just beneficial for one thing, whether it's osteoporosis or bone health or, or what have you, or cognition, but how does it fit in the context of all of the aging related outcomes? You know, what is it, what's that net effect? And it would be, it would be ideal for us to be able to come forth with, I don't know if it's a recommendation or at least some sort of a statement that says, um, you know, here are the foods or the food groups or the nutrients that we want to focus upon. And maybe it is simply just a plant-based diet. Um, on the other hand, maybe there are particular supplements that may or may not fit the bill and have the evidence that supports it. Um, a multivitamin in particular has shown some promise across different studies and domains. It will be interesting to see how that extends to osteoporosis and bone health, in particular in our Cosmos trial. Um, 
but even for vitamin D, I think the jury is still out. You know, is it again? Is it a global effect in everyone? Probably not. Again, it's it's about um, what we call precision medicine or precision nutrition. There might be ways that we can quickly go to our doctor or endocrinologist or provider, and they can ask a few quick questions or do a quick test that would enable us to better identify what we can benefit from in terms of supplements or a diet or otherwise. Yeah. Wow. That would be. That would be fabulous. But I just want to emphasize one point is that don't lose, um, even though we're talking about dietary supplements predominantly, to not lose sight of the importance of a, of a good, broad, overall diet. That can never be emphasized enough. Um, that is always our first line defense um, for diet and lifestyle, physical activity, stress levels low, getting sleep. Um, social interactions. These are the things that are really critical for a much more holistic view of health, um, more integrated health outcomes um, that would include bone health and many other ones too. Well, that's really great. Uh, thank you. That's, those are great. Let me just uh, make sure I have asked. Um... Oh, are you familiar with the taking a calcium supplement at the same time uh, that you might be eating a food that is high in oxalates, contains oxalates. Um, we, you know, we sometimes read that the calcium that negates the effect of getting the absorption of the calcium into the system. Have you read about it? Any of that? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not as familiar with that as I should be, admittedly. Um, but it does speak to the complexities that we face, you know, with calcium as an example, and oxalate is a good, a good working example of, we know that our, our dietary intake can impact the ability for us to absorb or not absorb particular nutrients. And obviously the goal that we have um, with the type of dietary pattern that we have, as well as any particular dietary supplements that we may consider to take, is that you wanna think about the net effects. Um, realistically, we never really want to, um, there's no reason to ever be excessive for any one particular nutrient or vitamin or bioactive component or mineral for that matter. It's always most important to make sure you're getting enough of it. So you're certainly not in a deficient state that doesn't happen too much, of course, in our country, but it does happen in, in vulnerable populations. Um, vitamin B12 is a good example of a, of an essential vitamin that in older populations, um, there's actually about depending on the study, about 10 to as high as 15% of, of older adults aged 60 or 65 and up are actually um, either deficient or insufficient with their vitamin B12 intake. For calcium and vitamin D and some of these other ones that we've often linked with, with osteoporosis and bone health more broadly, um, there's such a focus on supplementation and dietary sources that we're probably never really in a position of having to worry about insufficiency or deficiency. So with that being said, certainly the oxalates are an important component of, of our calcium uptake, but at the same time, it's probably not going to make or break things um, for our own individual health. Um, think about the overall dietary pattern first and then worry about the individual nutrients after. Okay. And for example, um, when in talking about that, do you think that, you know, we, we've had um, uh, been spoken with before by someone who was um, very keen on the absorption levels um, that you could get from um, a food, for example, uh, milk versus yogurt, and the absorption of calcium is much different. So even though one uh, milk, for example, could be much higher, yogurt would actually have a higher absorption level. Um, is that something that you've noted or no? Yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely correct. Um, there's nothing incorrect about that statement. And this is the challenge of diet. We know that um, even some of the other essential vitamins um, that we consume, sometimes they are better absorbed with water, sometimes in fats. So, um, so the thing you have to be mindful of is, you know, certainly in the context of calcium source, dietary sources, um, yogurt, you're going to get a little bit better absorption rate than you would from some of the milk products directly. Um, but at the same time, it's still most important to think about just the overall quality of the diet and not get too hung up in those deep. I'm not saying you should ignore those, those pieces of information, but not get overly hung up in it. Um, you know, one thing I always tell um, 
our participants in our studies, as well as when I'm talking with the media outlets on, on some of the work I've been involved in is focus less on the details and more of the, of the broader strokes, right? So, you know, how, how am I eating? Am I getting a, am I eating lots of healthy foods in moderation? That in combination is going to be probably your best bet. It's almost like eating a multivitamin in terms of foods and, and, and other and, and beverages. Um, in a way, that's your best first line defense for ensuring that you have sufficient calcium intake as well as all the other essential minerals and vitamins and some of the other interesting bioactives that are now out there as well. That's really good. Thank you. Um, let me see. Uh, so I, I see um, I see some of the questions ahead. in the chat here. They're actually yes. quite good. Okay, um, go ahead. And if I can maybe um, sure. be through some of them. So so there's a question here about um, about prebiotic fiber supplements. Um, some of the products, for example, you might get at CVS. Um, and certainly getting um, any fiber in the diet is a good thing. So let's start with that. So depending on the quality of your diet based on the food that you're eating. Um, that to me is again, your first line defense. But if you feel like going to a prebiotic fiber supplement, um, I think going up to 10 grams per day is a reasonable um, recommendation. But again, um, everything, even on the supplement side should be in moderation. Um, you know, take what's recommended on the, on the labeling for that product um, and either go to that level or even go to just half of it, knowing that you're getting fiber from other sources. So, um, but again, it's, it's not just a simple, you know, obviously we want to get fiber intake from multiple food sources and not just from, um, supplemental sources or, or powders or however else you might get them. Um, there's another question here. Um, just asking about the role of, um, genetics, which is always an interesting question to me, as well as coming back to the microbiome and its impact on, on bone health. Um, this comes to this um, concept that's called um, either precision medicine or precision nutrition. The idea is that if we um, can do a test or two that can identify particular aspects of our genetic code or in our microbiome that can better identify who might be more likely or less likely to benefit from certain lifestyle choices or drug choices or, or, um, or um, supplement choices. I mean, this is the wave of the future that a lot of us in the field would like to see. The hard part is in the details. It's, it, it takes very large studies and undertake, research undertakings to really tease out those types of details. Um, so that is the, we can look at it and there are big initiatives that are out there. There's something called the All of Us Research Program, which is a nationally supported research project that will get comprehensive data on diet and nutrition and connecting it with genetics and other, uh, and I believe the microbiome is part of that as well. That will eventually yield us lots of, it'll be a treasure trove of data. The hard part is it takes years for these studies to enroll the patients and it takes years for the outcomes to develop that we're interested in. Not everyone's going to um, develop osteoporosis overnight, fortunately, but it takes time for those people, even if it's a lot of people, to develop it. So we'll have those answers eventually. And that's probably gonna be the wave of, of um, nutrition and recommendations for our next decade, maybe not this one. Sure. Um, do you see any other question you'd like to ask, uh, you'd like to address? I mean, Yeah, I think um, the other one that I think is um, interesting here is, sorry, I just lost it. Oh, um, at, there's a question asking about the impact of caffeine on the absorption of calcium and uh, magnesium supplements in particular. Um, and um, I don't know enough specifically about um, caffeine. So uh, what's interesting is that a lot of times people will take their supplements in the morning. They'll wake up in the morning, um, they'll have breakfast, and then it's always good to take supplements with food. I wanna start with that. Having any supplements on an empty stomach is usually not ideal. Um, so to have it just with a cup of coffee um, or tea is probably not optimal, only because most supplements are going to be better absorbed in the context of a food matrix, whether it's food you're eating for breakfast in some way, or at least a meal. Um, and even for something like magnesium supplementation, which is actually another area of interest of mine as well, um, sometimes depending on the type of magnesium you take, um, you're, you can sometimes have some GI symptoms from taking it. Um, so it's all the more important to have it with food. 
Caffeine could affect the absorption of some of the minerals such as calcium and magnesium a little bit, but not to the extent that I would be massively concerned. I'd be more concerned that, you, that you, it's important to make sure you're having any dietary supplements in particular that you might be taking with food. That's, that's the most important thing. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Um, let me see. There is another question here I thought was interesting. Um, so there's another question here about whether these, some of these lifestyle interventions also might be important for cognitive health. My simple answer is yes, certainly. It is definitely true. And this gets at the idea of, you know, how do we age? It's not just how do we age in terms of getting older, it's how do we age well? We want to age well and have a high quality. We want to still be able to go out and about and do what we do and remember everything and be sharp and, and be stimulated and, and listen to sessions like this and, and follow everything and, and have take home messages. So all of these things really are important, not just in the context of osteoporosis and, and bone health, but but um, cognition and, and vascular outcomes and, and everything that rolls into aging, all the things that we care deeply about. Um, uh, let me see. What about calcium with other food sources? I mean, you've already sort of negated our calcium, the idea of taking calcium or whatever in that one study, but I'm just wondering, I, I mean, I'm sure you know that um, you know, eating it is probably the more important thing. And I think people are, are aware of that and they're wondering, um, is there a, a better way to get it if you're, a, you know, have a dairy problem, if you, um, you know, are there any, any suggestions in those areas? Yeah, you know, um, the, the, I'm, I, you know, it's funny, as much as I do research and dietary supplements, I'm not trying to be that negative on them. I, I, they still certainly have a role. And in the case of, um, you know, calcium, certainly if you have concerns about your calcium intake, whether it's based on the type of diet that you're following or you don't have, or you're lactose intolerant, it is completely fine to take, you know, modest amounts of, of supplemental calcium. I'm certainly not um, uh, against it in that regard, of course. But at the same time, um, it's important to know what the food sources are. And for something like calcium, um, as we've, you know, obviously outside of the cow-based sources, um, you know, some, there's lots of other milks that are out there now, almond milk, soy milk, um, you know, there's pretty much any type of nut has its milk now these days, oat milk are all often um, um, have calcium added to them. Um, you'll also find calcium in a lot of the um, leafy green vegetables. So things like uh, kale and broccoli, um, not necessarily spinach, but, um, but kale and broccoli are also good sources of calcium as well. Um, again, yogurt's a good source. You can have some of the Greek yogurts if you're able to tolerate that. Um, and then there's also fish such as um, salmon and then tofu. Um, so there's, there's lots of sources out there for calcium. Um, supplements are certainly still a viable option, but certainly not the only option, especially if you're lactose intolerant or um, if you're avoiding certain um, dairy products in particular. Well, thank you. You know, one more question. How about that? Mm -hmm. I know we, we've gone over, but um, someone asked about bioactives. Uh, you had brought that up yourself and you mentioned flavonoids in that whole study with the cocoa flavonoids. Um, could you actually elaborate a little bit more on that and any um, simple evidence-based recommendations? Yeah, so um, so bioactives are a little bit of a catch-all term. We always think about the essential vitamins, you know, vitamin A, vitamin, all the B vitamins, C, D, E, kind of the alphabet, if you will. Um, and then the essential minerals. So, you know, all, all the ones that we've been talking about. Um, but there's this other category that's out there that aren't essential to health, but yet still could have potential health benefits associated with it. So bioactives are a very wide catch-all term that encompasses pretty much anything else that could be in foods or beverages um, that could confer benefits of health. Um, and in particular, so flavonoids are a, a very broad term of several thousand types of compounds. 
Um, but more specifically, there's a type of flavonoid, it's called flavin three alls. It's kind of like, it sounds more like a, chemi a chemistry class than it is a, um, a, a session about nutrition, but, but these flavin three alls, um, one of the food sources is our cocoa, is the cocoa bean or, or cocoa powder or cocoa products. Um, but there are other flavin three all food sources that go beyond that. So most berries will be good sources such as blueberries or raspberries or blackberries any of the berries, again, these are all things that have rich color to it, right? Colorful foods or healthy foods. Um, this also extends to red, uh, to, to grapes, red grapes and red wine, and also to the coffee beans. So beans and berries and grapes in simplistic terms are usually your best sources of flavin three alls. And, um, and there has been a, a push by some um, nutrition groups more recently to suggest that um, the evidence might might be getting close to some sort of a dietary recommendation with regard to dietary flavin three alls, emphasizing these particular plant-based foods, whether it's a cocoa bean or a coffee bean or, uh, or, or tea in particular, um, or um, some of the berries and, and grapes. Um, it, again, it's kind of an offshoot of the idea of it's a plant-based diet. We, you know, not that we can't have meats and other things in moderation. We certainly can, but but the flavanols and the flavonoids are a good example of a bioactive for which there is a, a good mounting evidence for its potential benefits for many different aging-related outcomes, not just in the cognitive space, but also uh, in the bone health space. And, and certainly, the Cosmos trial will be be delving into that with some of the work that we're actively doing. I, for one, am extremely excited that you're right here in Boston, and uh, I, I'm excited about knowing there's the Osher Center right here at Mass General, and that you're you're directing it. So, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sesso. We are just so grateful for your time today. And thank you um, for the opportunity to to chat with you. And um, I appreciated all of the questions. Um, all the questions were important ones. It's a confusing landscape and um, it's difficult to, especially with the way that the news is presented through no direct fault of anyone's, um, what do you make, how do you make sense of it? And what are the actual take home messages that matter to you individually? So I'm glad I had an opportunity to talk it through with all of you. So thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a 